Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the Rotopros.com Best DFS show that just happens to come at you around 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. This is the last EPL breakdown for this season, Match Week 38, Sunday, May 19th, 2019. Uh, very interesting slate. We have a massive 10 game slate, so let's not waste any time. Jump right into the schedule. First game in the slate, we have Man City making the trip from up north in Manchester. Manchester down to the south coast to play Brighton. Next game of the slate, we have Arsenal making the trip from London up north to play Burnley. Third game of the slate, we have Bournemouth making a really quick trip from the south coast into London to play Crystal Palace. The next game, we have Newcastle making the trip all the way up north into London to play Fulham. We have Chelsea making the trip from London into Leicester City. We have Wolves making the trip up to Liverpool. And then to the second page here, we have Cardiff making the trip from Wales up to Manchester to play Manchester United. We have Huddersfield making the trip down south to play Southampton. Everton making the trip from Liverpool into London to play Spurs. In the final game of the slate, we have a London derby between West Ham United and Watford. So yeah, massive slate. A couple things I wanted to talk about first. There's just going to be a ton of outcomes here this slate. So chances are, unless what you're thinking is completely off the off the charts, it's most likely not going to happen. And that isn't attack on your personal beliefs or thoughts. It's just the general build of the slate. Uh, a lot of the favorites aren't necessarily going to come out as the big plays for the slate. So there's a lot of different ways you can take this. Don't be afraid to be a little bit crazy in GPPs. And especially if you're in either a smaller or a bigger, uh, you may have to... Uh, compared to a smaller or a bigger, you may have to get a little bit crazy uh, to actually take it down. So yeah, let's uh, let's just jump right into this. Uh, uh, I think it's also important to talk about uh, jumping into the first game here, Manchester City versus Brighton. Um, there is a lot of different competitions still going on. And while, for example, Manchester City and Watford do play in the FA Cup this next weekend, uh, a lot of these teams still play in whether it's the Euro Cup final or the Champions League final, as both are all English finals this year. Uh, so a lot of these teams form, as of recently especially, is very uh, correlated to their European success. So the more teams are deeper into your competitions, that's where their focus goes, where their domestic may slide a little, and where a lot of these teams may have realized long ago, outside of really Liverpool, uh, that the title race was over their focus started going elsewhere. So, yeah, um, I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, Man City doesn't really necessarily have to worry about that too much because they're only in the FA Cup, a little bit different. They've already been put out of Champions League. However, uh, they basically are really the cream of the crop they have been for the past few seasons they've lost only four times this season they've won 13 straight 17 out of their past 20 and they actually haven't lost since uh, the 29th of january over the 13 straight they didn't concede more than a single goal per game and in 10 of those 13 games ended in a clean sheet for man city uh they've had clean sheets in four of the previous five ten of the previous 12 including four straight six straight away wins five of those six were clean sheets however they haven't actually scored more than three goals in uh, 10 straight. Uh, in fact, they haven't scored more than three goals in an away game since November of last year. Uh, and uh, an interesting fact from them, I'm trying to give everyone an interesting fact this year to keep it light. Uh, this slate, I should say, uh, this year, uh, this slate. Uh, they haven't actually lost to Brighton ever in their English Premier League history, which isn't really saying a lot since Brighton hasn't been in the league too long. Uh, but they've only conceded once, uh, one goal uh, to Brighton in their English Premier League history. And that's a, that's a little bit more interesting. And uh, turning to Brighton, uh, they are winless in eight straight, losing uh, five of their previous eight and shut out in six uh, straight games. Now, Brighton basically fell off the, the face of the earth for the past uh, couple months, uh, which was uh, fairly dramatic for them considering they have been slightly below average but definitely not uh, battling for relegation which they're basically put into uh, they, uh, ha they've they scored only two goals in, uh, over those uh, eight games excuse me and they've been shut out uh, 14 times this season which is pretty massive they they haven't actually been scoring a lot of goals they've they've won only three of their previous 22 games and they haven't scored more than once in 11 straight games they are a much better home team. Uh, six of their nine wins have come at home this season, and 24 of their 56 conceded goals this season happened at home. So that's less than half of their conceded goals uh, have come at home. And the the interesting for them is that uh, they actually have scored, last scored, their only goal they've ever scored against City was this exact fixture 
last season uh just a, a week a, a week uh past this so basically next week on march uh 18th i think it was which would have been uh the the final uh game last season so yeah uh very uh very cut and dry really but in terms of the success what we really have to ask here is two things one the city ownership when people see city are playing brighton and two how good can city actually do here uh because one of the big factors is that city hasn't been scoring a lot of goals as of late so uh basically city and many teams uh, in terms of that can only really do one thing well they aren't very they're very rarely will be a team that will be scoring tons of goals and playing perfect defense generally speaking the attention of a player goes one way or the other and it's really hard to transition and that would define like the ultimate professional best team or players is uh, teams that can tr transition between a an attacking focus and a defensive focus and be near perfect in the other side of the field because no question that City have been uh, perfect in terms of their uh, their performances and their results are near perfect I should say but uh, defensively is really where they're focusing right now and a lot of the slate for me isn't spending up in goalkeepers and i'll break that down as we go through here but in terms of this uh ederson is just a little bit too expensive simply because brighton will not be taking enough shots and he doesn't have really viable defensive options at the back so i'm not too interested in ederson uh when we get more ahead here again we're looking at ownership and ceiling and uh 8k compared to the other 8k guys have a much better shot at a three goal ceiling than six City simply based off their most recent results where they've been winning most of their games on less than three total goals so I'm not necessarily looking for guys in GPP who are going to have a lot of ownership and really struggle to hit their ceiling so maybe if you want to take a Marez or a Sané in cash and hope to cash in on some corners uh, maybe catch a floor because their salary at 7.9 isn't really that crazy but up front uh, again uh, Aguero and Jesus will most likely be sharing minutes so I'm not necessarily interested in picking one or the other uh considering a 90 minute game isn't really likely and to further that Brighton has been a much better team at home they've made a name for themselves at home and really that name has been built around not only good solid defensive performances at home but keeping the bigger teams to a lower result uh, so it for the first value keeper play of the slate Matt Ryan's definitely up there he's not my favorite value keeper but to speak very bluntly, play a value keeper this slate. That's really how you should start your builds. All of your builds should include a goalkeeper that costs less than 4.5k. If you're over that, it isn't necessarily a bad play, but it's going to alter your scripting and what you're necessarily able to build uh, later on uh, whenever you need to start spending money on bodies. Uh, so the place to spend down this slate is absolutely keeper, and a lot of that starts with one Man City isn't going to score as many goals as a lot of people think they will. Uh, so yeah, Matt Ryan. Now, in terms of his defense, he doesn't really have a lot of defensive options, so I'm not necessarily too interested. Bong is really the only interesting defensive uh, option for a floor, and even then, it's not very good. Uh, so I'm not necessarily looking for a, a defensive stacking option with... Uh, uh, with Matt Ryan, excuse me, and then looking further into the midfield, even though City probably won't do as well as their salaries will demand, uh, they will still be good enough to not allow Brighton to really be that great. Uh, so I'm not as keen on some of these guys. Uh, a lot of that has to do with Pascal Grove's minutes still really haven't ironed out as well as I would have liked. Uh, may, I, you could probably risk it this late at 4.9k, but he's not going to have much of a floor for cash and for ceiling you would really just need him to cash in on a goal which is a big ask in itself i'd rather take someone like Sally march who you know is going to have an opportunity to get at least five crosses no matter the competition uh he's been more than good enough to do that all season so i'm not necessarily looking at Sally march to be like a shoe in gpp or cash play but if you're looking for a really cheap option of 4.2k and you're kind of looking for someone in either format i think Sally march can pass as long as he does get the start this late which is kind of a big ask and then up front Brighton very simply have been scoring. Uh, they have been scoring at home. They have been scoring away, which really lends the idea to a low-scoring game, which kind of gives it to Ederson a little bit. But at the same time, I don't think Brighton will do enough to really cush 
Christian Ederson enough to for either format from 6K, where on the other hand, Matt Ryan gets a lot of check marks because it's going to be a low-scoring game. It's going to be low-owned. There's going to be a lot of ownership on the other side of the field. Uh, so, yeah, I do like Matt Ryan a lot. He's probably the only player I would take from Brighton, and I do have him as one of my top three keeper plays of this slate. So Matt Ryan, 3.5K. Don't shy away from him. Final score. I'm going to make a bold prediction. My bold prediction for this slate is that either Man City or Liverpool are going to lose. One of these two teams is going to lose. And honestly, I don't think Man City is going to win this game. Uh, it uh, Again, I'll even go crazier. Neither Man City nor Liverpool are going to win this slate. I'm not saying they're both going to lose, but I, I'll be... I, I, I do have a feeling that uh, a lot of these games will end up surprising a lot of the mass ownership that will jump on the final slate of the season. Uh, so I'm going to say a 0-0 draw for this game. That's my betting score. But I think the final score that would make sense would be 2-0 Man City. And that still wouldn't include enough for Man City to pay off from their salary and their ownership. So 2-0 Man City, but I'm betting on a 0-0 draw. Next game on the slate, we have Arsenal traveling to Burnley. Now, Arsenal just finished playing uh, midweek against Valencia, and they uh, made it to the Europa League final, which will be played against Chelsea. However, domestically, they are winless in four straight, losing three of their four and four of their previous six. They haven't scored more than a goal in three straight. They've lost back-to-back -back away games, conceding in three goals each, and they're winless in four of their previous five away. They've won only three of their 14 away games this season, losing seven of those 14 away games and they've kept only one clean sheet away from home all season there's been at least three total goals and both teams have scored in 13 of the 14 and 18 uh, uh excuse me let me rephrase that sorry there's been at least three total goals in 13 of their 18 away games this season and both teams have scored in 14 of their 18 away games this season so that's something to remember here uh basically there's going to be goals for both sides and one team's probably going to score twice and that's the general rule of arsenal away games and their interesting fact for this lay is uh they've actually never lost an, uh, an epl game to burnley winning eight straight and obviously uh eight of the nine uh, games that they've played against each other tying the other game uh so yeah for burnley uh they are winless in three straight losing back-to-back -back games but it was against city and everton so i'll give them a little bit of grain of salt however they've won only three of the previous 10 games and while they've lost three of the previous five at home they've lost only four of the previous of their previous 10 as well so it's kind of a recent uh downturn and trend for burnley and they are a better home team they've always been a better home team seven of their 11 wins this season have come at home and uh they are winless like i said against arsenal in nine straight so they do have a lot to prove this slate uh now in terms of arsenal like i mentioned they've kept only one clean sheet away all season no, uh, I'm just not looking at the goalkeepers, uh, the slate. Defensively, there still isn't even a lot to ask here. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that their main producers are hurt and out. So uh, I'm not really necessarily keen on the Arsenal defenses at all. Now, when we get into the midfield, they do have some interesting options due to the salaries. But in terms of an overall ceiling or outcome, I don't expect a lot from Arsenal in this game. They've already got basically everything locked up that they needed. They do need a result over Manchester United. They will fall one position. But even then, that isn't going to change a whole lot of things. Um, now... In terms of uh, up front, that's really where, if you're going to play Arsenal, this is where you want to look. Uh, simply because Amabang and Lacazette are both elite uh, forward options. Um, in terms of cash and GPP, I think if I was to do one or the other, I would definitely do Lacazette in cash and uh, OBS in GPP. But I think you can get away with stacking both of them in GPP or only taking uh, one or the other in a, a GPP setting. So, uh, yeah, I'm not interested in anything other than the attackers of Arsenal. And then looking over to Burnley, conversely, I think you can get away with some Tom Heaton. He definitely isn't my favorite keeper. He isn't even in my top three keepers. Uh, 
Uh, but I do think he makes some sense, especially from a GPP standpoint, uh, because Arsenal are most likely looking past this. Their season's done. Uh, they're exhausted from their midweek, and they're probably going to be starting a, a few random guys because they're very hurt. And in that case, I think it could be a lot of fake value, and a lot of people may jump on that value thinking it'll be worthwhile. So I do like Tom Heaton. He just isn't the thousand dollars cheaper that you'll see in the other guys. Uh, now we go into the mid, or excuse me, the defense here, and Charlie Taylor is really the only option as a low floor. And for 4.1k, I'd rather it be 3.1 or 3.5k. So I'm just not really interested in the Burnley def Burnley defense. Maybe a little bit of Tom Heaton, but that would be about it. And then going into the midfield, that's really where the options are. I do like Ashley Westwood for GPP. He's seeing 90 minutes, and he has the ability to break slates. Uh, Johan Berg Goodmanson and uh, Dwight McNeil are just their minutes are, are a serious concern for me at the moment. So I would really like to jump on either of them, but it's hard to say what will happen. Depending who starts, if Dwight McNeil gets the start, I will consider him, but it definitely isn't something I'm going to jump all over in this game. Now, up front is really where I'll be paying the most attention to on Burnley. Uh, whether it's Ashley Burns at 7K or Chris Wood at 6.9, again, their minutes haven't been ideal, uh, but at the same time, uh, they kind of come off to me this slate as a guaranteed goal for one or the other and a potential two goals from either of them, uh, and they could achieve that at 75 minutes, which would be more than enough to deal with in GPP. So definitely don't play them in cash. Uh, Burnley is not a cash play at all this slate. They're pre purely a GPP, and uh, whether you want to go either Tom Heaton or the forwards uh, or just take uh, all three together, why not? But don't look for a defensive stack uh, from Burnley. They're probably going to concede. So... Uh, I would even say, no, I'll rephrase what I said earlier. Burnley, uh, you can go Tom Heaton cash in the forwards GPP. I think that makes a lot more sense. And I'll say a final score here, a 1-1 draw, maybe 2-1 Burnley would be ideal. But I think uh, uh, both teams should score, and I'll be really surprised if one team doesn't score twice, and that should be Burnley. So I'll say Burnley 2, Arsenal 1. Next game on the slate, we have one of my favorite games of the slate, Bournemouth traveling to Crystal Palace. So Bournemouth are coming into this incredibly inconsistent. They've won only two of the previous five and three of the previous ten games. However, where it gets interesting, excuse me, is they've scored ten, uh, scored eleven, excuse me, and conceded ten goals in their previous five away games. Twelve of their eighteen losses this season have come away from home, and while they've lost two of their previous five away games, uh previous nine away to that uh they were uh, on a massive losing streak like a lot of that of excuse me a lot of their away record has to do with that massive uh nine game losing streak away from home that they're falling on they've had at least three total goals in 12 of their 18 away games this season and they've they've conceded a massive 40 away goals this season which is up there with some of the worst teams in the league uh in terms of away records uh but what really makes Bournemouth so interesting is Callum Wilson uh he's actually tied for third in the league with nine away goals and that's up there with uh Sala, Harry Kane, it's just a couple more of them. He's tied with Sala and uh, Zaha. So, uh, yeah, really interesting uh, away selection in Bournemouth. I think they make a lot of sense for GPP. And in terms of Crystal Palace, they've been alternating on a win and a not win since March they haven't lost in three straight or in four of their previous five. Uh, however, they do have one of the worst home records in the entire league. They've won only one of their previous five and two of their previous ten home games. And in... Two of those 10, uh, they scored uh, only more than, uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that. In uh, two of those 10 games, outside of uh, the two of the 10 previous home, uh, they've score only scored more than once. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, really low scoring games at Palace. Only four of their 13 wins this season have come at home. And they're interesting is that. Bournemouth just allow everything, everything. So I'm not necessarily expecting a massive uh, ceiling from the Palace team, but I'm definitely expecting a lot of floors to go around because Bournemouth just allow attackers to do whatever they want. So very quickly looking at Bournemouth, there's two ways to really take this. Whichever keeper happens to get the start, uh, they're going to see enough shots to to form a ceiling it's just a matter of whether they can do that now palace has been bad at home all season so i do like the idea of a bournemouth defensive stack the real issue is trying to find a viable defender to go with it as there really isn't too much uh maybe go with adam smith but like 
his numbers really aren't that impressive from 4.2K unless they get the clean sheet. So again, strictly GPP, do not play Bournemouth defensive at all in cash. That's a strict GPP. And then as you get up a little bit further, the reason I think uh, you can get away with Ryan Fraser is quite simply he's just a... a <laughs> obscene crosser of the ball it's a little bit crazy um so you can't really ignore that from 8k especially against a team like crystal palace but the big idea here is to stack ryan frazier and calm wilson in gpp uh they are by far the most viable stack away from home in the league and they are the most fruitful stack in the league period so yeah i, I do really like uh, stacking this in gpp or just getting some Ryan Frazier in cash from AK. He definitely isn't my favorite cash play. He's a top five, uh, but uh, you can definitely get away because you know he's going to just have free reign with the crosses. So, yeah, stack uh, him and Wilson in GPP or just take him in cash and maybe take a, a Bournemouth defensive in GPP if you're feeling a little risky. Now, in terms of Crystal Palace, I'm not interested in Guaida or a defensive stack whatsoever. You may be able to get away with a little bit of Juan Bensaka, but again, it's like... You're asking for floor, and if he doesn't hit that floor, you're in trouble. And he's been pulling around three fantasy points for the since he came back from injury. So I'm not necessarily interested in any kind of Palace defensive. And as you look more ahead, uh, this is definitely where I'm be locking in a lot of my ownership for uh, really cash this slate. Millie's the first guy I'm going to. Uh, Luka Milicevic, whether it's Bournemouth potentially giving up crosses, giving up a penalty shot, everything. Millie's just on the spot for having a match the floor this slate and while other guys he should be 8.3k let's put it that way he'll be seeing comparable floors to guys that are at 8 point whatever uh so yeah that's what i really like about millie and you can get away with some townsend 8.2k is a little bit big of an ask considering he's been rather inconsistent in both minutes and scores but i think uh since bournemouth do allow so much you could probably roll with townsend and gpp if you'd like Maybe in cash, I'd rather just go with Millie. And, of course, we always have Wilfred Zaha, who is too cheap at 7.9K. Now, I know, again, that uh, he, he has been uh, better away from home than at home, obviously, like most of Crystal Palace. So I'd rather just stick with Millie and have my fun with that in either format and see where that leads me and chase the penalty shot as the ceiling rather than chase Zaha at home, where he just hasn't been performing uh, on the score sheet as well. Uh, so this this could be a, a tough one. It could very easily finish like 2-2. Two, two. It could finish 3-2. I think if it does, it would definitely be a Bournemouth win. Uh, Bournemouth are going to score more than Crystal Palace. It's just a matter of, not, matter of whether or not Crystal Palace can score at all. So I will say final score. Bournemouth score at least two. Crystal Palace will be lucky to score once. So yeah, let's say 2-1 final score just to be safe. 3-1. I want to be risky. Next game, we have Newcastle traveling to Fulham. Uh, so another really interesting game here. Uh, Newcastle's coming into this undefeated in three of their previous five. They are much worse away from home, however. They've won only three of their 18 away games this season, meaning, of course, only three of their 11 wins this season have come away from home. They've won only one of their previous 10 away games. Uh, but the big thing to remember for Newcastle is that they really rarely get blown out. Uh, they've conceded more than twice away way only twice all season and those games were to Liverpool who scored four on them and Manchester United who scored three on them so generally speaking when they lose it's by two goals or less and they're interesting is that they suck going to London very simple straightforward uh, they've lost nine of their last 12 away games in London so just it's been a running theme for a very long time for Newcastle. They don't play very well in London. A lot of it has to do with history. If you're not really a soccer fan, you may not know the deep history of Newcastle and how far they go back. But them and London clubs have are just steeped in history. So, yeah. Newcastle just doesn't do very well in London. It's it's a thing, I guess you could say. And some people don't like to bet on things. Well, nine of their last 12 away trips to London, they end up losing. So there's your thing. <laughs> so yeah, Fulham, uh, they are undefeated in three of their previous five. However, they have lost seven of their previous 10 and nine of their previous 12 games. They have won back-to-back -back games at home without conceding. And generally speaking, they have been much better at home all season. Six of their seven wins have come at home. And nine of their 24, I should say nine of their 20 
25 losses have been at home as well. So the vast majority of their losses have come away from home and their vast majority of wins have been at home. They're interesting is that they've won eight of their previous nine home games versus Newcastle. So like I just said, uh, Newcastle's bad going into London and Fulham has been massive beneficiaries of that as they've won eight of their previous nine home games versus Newcastle. So yeah, um, looking quickly at Newcastle, you can think about some Debraca. I would probably keep him in GPP uh, just because his floor has been at, completely non-existent. Uh, but at the same time, Newcastle don't allow a lot of shots and they're not allowing a lot of goals. So even if he does not allow a lot of goals, he's still going to be fairly pushed to find a true ceiling compared to raw points and other people. So 4.6K isn't the worst for GPP, but definitely is my favorite. Defensively, he does have some interesting options. You'll have to pick through them depending on who ends up starting. Manquillo does have a pretty decent floor from 4.8K, but I think there's a lot better floors and uh, more expensive options, I guess you could say. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the midfield, I'm not necessarily looking too deeply at Newcastle here. I'm expecting this to be a really low-scoring game, first of all. And second of all, I'm not expecting them to win. So that just doesn't necessarily dictate high ceilings. Uh, Matt Ritchie will continue to have a really decent floor. But again, 7.5K is a pretty big ask when you can have Milicevic for a little bit less or other names for a little bit less or more. So I'm not necessarily too interested in a lot of Newcastle midfield. And up front, the only place I'd really be looking at them is Rondon. Uh, he, again, much better at home. So a stri strictly a far GPP reach. Uh, Perez, you could. His minutes aren't as excitable as I would like. But uh, yeah, if I was to go anywhere, it would definitely be Rondon is as far, excuse me, as I was stretched for some GPP. So I'm not necessarily too interested in Newcastle this late. Uh, but uh, full on the other hand, um, it, it's tough because Sergio Rico very simply isn't sustainable. Uh, he sees so many shots every game that basically eventually he's going to strike goal. That was the fact. And um, he has been hitting it quite well. But again, like, yeah, this is good. It, it's tough because I don't want to say don't play him, but it should be a low scoring game. He's been getting lots of clean sheets and he's at home. I'm concerned about his ownership. Uh, but in terms of defenders, you can definitely look at someone like Joe Bryan at 5.4K. I think he has tremendous floor that's really solid and looking at a, a really good shot for double digits, especially uh, in terms of cash. So not necessarily a GPP play. If you have to play someone with Sergio Rico, he's definitely the place to go. But I'd rather just play Joe Bryan at 5.4K as, as a defender. That's the first running theme of defenders here. I really like spending up defense this slate. Now, going in the midfield, nothing to look at at all. Uh, whether it's no floor, no ceiling, there's just no real point. I like Ryan Session as a player. Maybe someday he'll be a superstar, but just not yet. And up front, Mitrovic has kind of fallen off. So if you're going to look at anywhere, it's definitely got to be Ryan Babel. And even then, uh, it's not necessarily something I'm looking at it in cash. GPP, sure, he's been much better at home than away. So I will think about that. Uh, but in terms of a cash option, it isn't there for me. I'd rather just stick with Joe Bryan, Cash, Ryan Babble, GPP. Final score, Fulham 2, Newcastle. I think they can score one, but they'll kind of be pushed to. They really shouldn't score more than one. So I'll say a Fulham 2, Newcastle 1 final score. Next game on the slate, we have Chelsea traveling to Leicester. So Chelsea is guaranteed a top four, but they just come off a 120-minute game over the midweek versus uh, Frankfurt, uh, which went to penalty shootouts that they won, and now they'll end up playing Arsenal in the final of the Europa League. So again, their form has been dramatically worse uh, domestically. Uh, but... Uh, They've lost only one of their previous five, two of their previous ten games. Uh, the thing is that they're just much worse away from home. Uh, they're winless in back-to-back -back away games, six of their previous away eight away games, and they've conceded uh, two or more goals in four of their previous five away games. Uh, they have conceded in 12 of their 13 previous away games, and in seven of their eight losses this season they have come away from home. So, Needless to say, much worse away team than they are at home. And Leicester, on the other hand, they 
they've they're coming into this in really good shape. They've lost only three of their previous ten and won four of their previous five home games. They've scored at least two goals while conceding no more than a goal in four of their previous five home games. The thing for them is that there's no real difference between them home and away. Uh, they have been better since Brendan Rodgers, and they haven't actually conceded to Chelsea in back-to-back English Premier League games. So I do like Leicester to be super sneaky here this late. And one of these two teams has been shut out in four of their previous five meetings. So we're looking at a potential clean sheet here. I don't necessarily think it's going to happen, but I think what that does dictate, on the other hand, is a low-scoring game. Now, what that to me says is that Leicester are probably going to win one nothing, 2 nothing. What that further says is that how good is Jamie Vardy going to do? That's really the next question you have to ask. Is the Vardy party in session this evening? I think it is. Uh, so yeah, it, Kepa is off the board for me, 4.8K. Too much risk. Leicester won't shoot enough to really warrant that kind of selection with that ownership. I think you could get away with some Alonso at 5.7K. He's definitely not my favorite uh, cash play, but I, I wouldn't play him in GPP unless you're stacking with Hazard. Now, I'd be further surprised to see all these people play this slate. Uh, Chelsea are probably going to start a lot of random people, and again, it will be false, uh, false value. So I'm not necessarily necessarily too excited Pedro and William will continue to take each other's minutes and Ross Barkley has a little bit of a floor from 5.3k but even then it's not that great there's lots of better options and then up front uh, Higuain won't see 90 minutes and whoever is coming on for him will obviously not be seeing enough minutes to have a big impact so Chelsea just really aren't that great of options this late and will probably draw lots of ownership because they are Chelsea now Leicester on the other hand I'm not necessarily keyed into the idea that Leicester are across the board great options if I was to take a keeper it would be uh, Casper Schmeichel at 4.7k but probably a little bit too expensive for me considering he is playing Chelsea depending on who Chelsea starts if Chelsea starts a bunch of nobodies absolutely Schmeichel's definitely in play with one of the wingbacks depending who starts again but I think it's safe to say the wingbacks are probably a little bit too cheap, whether it's Pereira, uh, Christian Fuchs, or uh, Ben Chilwell, uh, either or. They all kind of do the same thing. Their minutes are all kind of shabby, and their ceilings aren't really there. So, yeah, um, it's tough because you want to take Smeichel in GPP, but he doesn't really have anyone to stack with. So maybe Smeichel naked by himself. I'm not necessarily interested in Madison simply because a lot of his ceiling is built off of floor and Chelsea generally don't allow a lot of floor. Now, if Chelsea look like they're starting hogwash, then you can think about some Madison from 8K. He's probably a top five, but barely for me. Uh, I would rather look up front, like I said, to Jamie Vardy, 8.1K. You probably don't want him for cash, but you're probably going to want him for GPP. Uh, I can definitely see him being one of the better GPP options this slate. Not many people are going to be owning him, thinking Chelsea is super good, where in fact they're actually really bad away from home, and Jamie Vardy steps it up against the bigger teams, especially against the teams from London, which you can take a quick look at here and notice what I'm talking about. London, London... Got two goals there, I know. South Coast. But yeah, uh, London. London. Seriously, Jamie Vardy plays good against London teams. Uh, so I have no problem with Jamie Vardy this late. If you want to stack him with someone, it's acceptable. Maybe I think him and Master are just too expensive to stack in GPP, period. But uh, it's just not cost viable with such a massive slate. But in, in terms of uh, a getaway here, I think Leicester can come away with like a, a one nothing, maybe a 2-1 kind of win, maybe a 1-1 one, one draw. Uh, but in terms of a final score, Leicester should score at least once, and Chelsea will be lucky to score once. I'll say a one nothing Leicester final win. Next game on the slate, we have Wolves making the trip to Liverpool. Uh, this is a really interesting game. Uh, really interesting. Wolves are coming into this winners of three straight. They've lost only one of their previous five and three of their previous ten games. Uh, the concern is that they are much, much, much better at home where they have eight straight games undefeated. Uh, they've won only one of their previous six and three of their previous ten away from home. And both teams have scored in seven of their previous ten and in eighteen of the or eleven of their eighteen away games this season. Uh, so that's also something to remember there uh, with Wolves that uh, teams tend to score on them, and uh, it, it can be tough like that. Uh, so the thing they don't always score back, and the big thing with Liverpool is. Uh, 
I want to say they don't always score back is that Liverpool may not allow that. Uh, Liverpool, obviously, if you don't know about Liverpool yet, you may not want to really be too deeply involved with this season uh, or the end of the season, excuse me. They're coming in this eight straight wins. They haven't lost in home all season, eight straight, 18 straight games, and uh, only one loss total this season. And they haven't conceded to Wolves in the English Premier League since 2011. So... The one thing I will speculate on this game, I'll speculate it, is that Wolves tends to step up against the bigger teams. Uh, this is a known thing now. They just always step up to the level or fall down to the level they're playing. So, yeah, uh, I am thinking about Wolves this late. I am thinking about them uh, in terms of a defensive They aren't going to score a lot of goals. They aren't going to like break the slate offensively. So... Uh, I do like Rio Patricio from 3.7K. He's a top three keeper play for me. Probably the third towards fifth. Uh, definitely not my favorite. I would rather take Matt Ryan against City, who haven't scored and don't need to score a lot of goals, compared to Liverpool, who absolutely need to score and win this game. So, uh, yeah. Uh, there isn't really much more to say about Liverpool other than you really should be playing Trent Alexander-Arnold at 6.3K. Uh, he has six assists in his past seven games, um, six in six of those games too. Uh, so one each game. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what else really to say here that hasn't been said a million times. A lot of this will depend on the starters. If it looks like or or Gigi's getting the start again, seven point nine is a little bit more comfortable than I'm comfortable with. Excuse me, but you can get away with it in GPP. But just focus on Trent Alexander Arnold this late. Hopefully he gets the start. Hopefully he sees ninety minutes because he's definitely one of my top defensive players from six point three K. Um, just pure quality. Uh, final score. I think this could very easily finish a 0-0 draw. Or uh, Liverpool will be pushed to get past one nothing. Uh, they could very easily do Liverpoolian things. And Wolves could just set up shop and give up after Liverpool starts scoring. But in terms of a final score, I do like a low scoring game. And another ceiling not being met on Liverpool players. Giving an option to a value keeper like Rio Patricio. Uh, outside of that, though, I'm really not too interested in this game as a whole. Uh, whether Matinho won't have enough floor, uh, Jota really shouldn't still be a thing. It's just a random goal from a bunch of salaries that aren't cheap enough. Uh, so, yeah, these guys should be down the fours. Uh, so, yeah, I will say final score, Liverpool 2, Wolves 1. Uh, final score. Next game in the slate, we have Cardiff traveling to Manchester United. Um, another really bizarre game here. Cardiff is winless in three straight. They've lost four of their previous five, eight of their previous ten, and 24 of their 37 games this season. They've been shut out in five of their previous six, eight of their previous ten, and four of their previous five away games as well. Only three of their nine wins were away from home this season, but their interesting fact is that they've actually been far more interesting away from home than they have been at home this season. So uh, I am interested in a little bit of Cardiff making some noise. Uh, Man United are winless in four straight and in back-to-back -back home games, losing three of their previous four games. They've won only two of their previous eight and four of their previous ten games. They've scored only four goals across their previous six games. Now, that being said, they are better at home. Only two of their nine losses this season have come at home. The big thing, though, is that they just have unbelievably bad defensive issues. So, I'm not interested whatsoever in the Manchester United defensive stack, and they haven't been scoring enough to really warrant enough up front. By the sounds of it, a lot of their players are leaving uh anton herrera made a big twitter uh, message goodbye so like things are slowly starting to change here at man united and i don't think they'll be looking too deeply at this game so i'm not going to look too deeply at manchester united and instead i'll be considering some cardiff i think etheridge is definitely a top three keeper play for me this late even a top two maybe even my top keeper play this slate i'll even go as far to say neil etheridge is my top keeper play this slate at only 3.6k manchester united just have been brutal they're probably going to score but that's really not the big concern from your low end keeper salaries you just don't want them to score a lot and manchester united's almost like the surefire guarantee to not score more than a goal this slate from a big 
big time salary or a, a big time favorite, excuse me. And defensively, I'm not really too keen in much. Uh, there isn't really a lot of floor despite the salaries. Without Camarasa, it will be interesting to see how things go. I don't hate Hoyland. I think he is cash viable to slate. He definitely isn't one of my favorite options, but I think you can get away with him. And then up front, uh, there isn't really a lot to look at with minutes. So for me, this slate, it's really Etheridge and Hoylet, uh one of the, uh, excuse me, Etheridge, my top keeper play. And I think you can play Hoylet in cash if you need some salary relief, which I, you're going to need two guys basically to spend down on this slate if you're going to spend up on defense. And uh, if you go keeper and Hoylet, I don't think that's a bad option at all. So I'll stick with just Etheridge for now. And I'll say final score here, 1-1 draw. United has been doing enough to keep a clean sheet, and they haven't really been, uh, excuse me, Cardiff hasn't been good enough to uh, really w outright win this game. So let's say a final score, 1-1. One, one, uh, Etheridge will have 8-10 to 10 fantasy points. Next game on the slate, we have Huddersfield traveling to Southampton. Uh, Huddersfield is the worst team in the league, second worst team in history. They haven't won since February, and they haven't won a home game in this calendar year. They've won only three of their 37 games this season, losing 28 of those 37. They've lost five of their previous eight and 11 of their previous 12 away games, and they've conceded 44, excuse me, they've lost five of their previous eight and 11 of their previous 12 away games, and they've conceded 44 away goals this season over their 18 games. Games, which is by far uh, really, really, really bad. And Southampton is winless in four straight and five of their previous six. However, they are much better at home. They've lost only one of their previous five, two of their previous eight at home, winning three of those five and four of those eight. They've lost only six of their 18 home games this season. Six of their 17 losses have also come at home. Now, an interesting thing for Southampton is both teams have scored in nine of their previous 10 and 14 of their 18 games this, uh, this season. And, uh, home games, excuse me. And at least three total goals in eight of their previous 10 and in 13 of their 18 home goal games this season. So we're seeing lots of goals and both teams score for Southampton. And I, uh, the long and short of it, I think this game right here is absolutely jam packed with a whole bunch of sneaky goals. If you're in King of the Pitch or uh, a really like a, a massive field game, uh, GPP, I think game stacking this game, attacking wise, is really, really sneaky. Uh, whether it's Redmond, Danny Ings, uh, Grant, way too cheap at 4.5k going up against the Southampton team who's letting in tons of goals, so I really don't hate that either. And then uh, you can even, uh, I, I don't know, I'd probably stay away from the goalkeepers here, whether it's low, slow, 3.8k. I'm really not too keen on that. Sorry, the the wheel's going there. Uh, simply because Southampton won't be doing enough to necessitate uh, uh, really a big floor or ceiling from Losel. Even if he uh, keeps everything out, he probably won't see enough shots to really warrant value compared to the other guys. And uh, going across the defense, again, there isn't really a whole lot of things here with Chris Lowe out. Uh, I'm not really too interested in Eric Drum. Uh, there just isn't a lot there. And You can consider some Aaron Moy from 5.2K. I'd probably keep it in GPP and stick away from cash. Uh, maybe some Bakuna in cash if he happens to start at a right back at 3.9K. He does have a solid enough floor to get that done. And up front, like I said, Grant is way too cheap. 4.5k I probably wouldn't take him in cash but GPP that's way too cheap especially if you want a game stack and look to spend up expensively as a defensive stack and then looking at Southampton uh, depending on which which keeper they start uh, I'm not spending up especially on a Southampton keeper especially on an expensive Southampton keeper this slate uh, defensively, I think you could potentially get away with, depending who's starting, uh, a little bit too expensive for me. I'd rather the other guys, especially someone coming in the other games here. Um, going into the midfield, like I said, I do like Ward Prowse, 7.8K. I think he does make sense for cash and for GPP, either or. He's going to see more than enough floor against Huddersfield. I do have a little bit of a concern of him properly like converting that to a true ceiling, uh, but if you happen to hit with him on a ceiling, uh, you'll be flying from 7.8K. So I I think uh, Ward Prowse is a really good option here for below 8K this slate. Uh, and then up front, again, as always, for most Southampton games, you never really want to play their forwards. The main reason for this is because Southampton forwards rarely play 90-minute games. Uh, you could consider someone like Nathan Redmond uh, because he does see a lot of 90-minute games, but 7.9K is way too expensive for someone like him who rarely gets a ceiling. Uh, so for cash or for, C or for GPP, there's no real point in spending up that much. Final score. 
score, I will say a three, or no, let's say a two-two draw, maybe a three-two win either way. I just like this to be super sneaky and a bunch of random people to find value this way. The big thing to remember about Southampton is they regularly start random people. Don't sleep in these random people. Uh, try and figure out from these random people's past game logs who plays more minutes and roll with that. Uh, I wouldn't play Stuart Armstrong. He tends to come off a lot, but if Josh Sims gets the start, don't be afraid to put him in. Uh, let's say 2-2 two, two, draw, 3-2 Southampton win. Next game, second last game. We're almost there. Everton at Spurs. Everton are undefeated in three straight. They've lost only one of their previous seven, two of their previous ten, and winning five of those seven and six of those ten. Uh, they've had a clean sheet in six of their previous seven and eight of their previous ten games. However, they are winless in back-to-back away games against Palace and Fulham, two teams you should be beating, and in three of their previous five as well. Uh, interesting for them is that uh, they actually have a really good defense, and Spurs has a really bad offense. And I have a DFS meta play where a good defense will always beat a bad offense. So don't sleep on uh, Pickford this slate. We'll get on him in a little bit here. But in terms of Spurs, they've won only two of the previous five, three of the previous ten. It is absolutely a Euro domestic fall apart. They are, of course, in the European final, a Champions League final against Liverpool. They've lost back-to-back games, three of the previous five, failing to score in each of those three of the five losses. And uh, someone has been shut out in four straight Spurs home games. So whether it's been Spurs or another team. And when you look at how many clean sheets Everton has been seeing lately, I think Pickford is by and far my top keeper play this late. Only 4.2K. It's absolutely a steal. Uh, Spurs are going to have obscene ownership. They're going to have way too much uh, in terms of salary. And uh, people will be jumping all over that and completely ignoring the Everton side of things. So, yeah, uh, Jordan Pickford. 4.2K, way too cheap, whether whatever way you look at it. Digne, follow it up with him at only 6K. I say only as in because he really should be 8K. Uh, he has all the upside you really need uh, for someone like an Everton player. Uh, excellent floor, has a ceiling whenever he hits a clean sheet, and he has the ability to score goals. Uh, he does take penalty shots too. Uh, so I really like Digne. Uh, and then going into the midfield, uh, really with uh, Richelson out, uh, it's very likely that Walcott's going to see 90 minutes this slate so i love walcott uh 5.2k i think he makes a ton of sense for gpp uh but mainly uh, you're going to want to get some siggy in uh at that salary for only uh 7.8k makes a lot of sense uh against the spurs team who should be allowing a lot and starting a lot of random players because they are really hurt at the moment uh, Hugo Lloris uh, is too expensive, 5.3K. Uh, Everton is just too good, even though Everton are away from home. Um, Trippier, you can use him at 5.5. I think he's not playing simply because he was really hurt in the Champions League semifinal over the midweek. So I'll be really surprised if anyone but Kyle Walker-Peters is on the list there. And he, 5.4K is just too expensive for him. And then going into the midfield... Uh, again, it's tough. It, it depends how they line up. Uh, with if Lorente gets to start, who ends up starting? Lemay may even start since he didn't see any time during the Champions League. Uh, so it, it's tough to say which way to go there, especially when I like Everton so much more on the other side. So yeah, I will say final score here: Everton one or two, Spurs nil. Everton should score at least once, and I'll be surprised if Spurs score once. So yeah, let's say a one nothing, two nothing, Everton win. Final game of the slate, we're here. West Ham at Watford. West Ham hasn't lost in three straight. However, they are much better at home, and unfortunately, they're away. They've won only two of their previous 10 away games. Five of their 14 wins and 10 of their 16 losses this season have been away from home. While they won last game against Spurs, they were on an eight-game winless streak before that, losing seven of those eight games. They've won only five of their 18 and lost 10 of their 18 away games this season. They haven't scored in three of their previous five and six of their previous 10 away games, and there's been less than three total goals in seven of their previous nine away games. And for Watford, they are in the FA Cup final against Man City next weekend, and they have won only one of their previous five, two of their previous eight, and three of their previous ten games. They are winless in three straight home games. Uh, previous uh, lost only one of their seven before these uh, three straight wins. Uh, winless, excuse me. Uh, they haven't scored in uh, excuse me, they haven't scored more than a goal in three straight games and four of their previous five. Uh, less than three total goals in five of their last eight home games. 
games and they scored less than two goals in seven of their ten home games. Previous ten home games, I should say. So I think we're looking at another really low scoring game this slate. You could re- probably roll with either keeper. I think both are a little bit too expensive. If I was to roll with one side, uh, it would probably be Ben Foster because West Ham has been so atrocious away from home. They they literally just haven't been scoring at large parts of the season away from home. Uh, defensively. Uh, I, I don't really like much on West Ham. You probably could use some Ryan Fredericks, but 4.5K is just a little bit too expensive for me. I don't see him kind of putting out double digits like he has been without a clean sheet. Uh, so that's just a little bit too expensive for me uh, when you should be spending much more, in my opinion. Uh, and then going into the midfield, Ernie's just too expensive. Uh, lack of minutes, been inconsistent with that. It's good he got the 90, but that's just as likely coming off his two-goal performance. Uh, and outside of him, there really isn't much in terms of minutes. Uh, so I'm not necessarily looking at West Ham. And then finally for Watford, uh, you like I said, Ben Foster is an okay GPP. Try and stack him with either Holobos or Janmat or all three. Maybe chase that clean sheet against West Ham. And then going into the midfield, depending how they line up, it's interesting to see Pereira's salary still down so low at 3.7K, but he hasn't been putting out enough DFS despite getting solid 90 minutes. So it's tough. He is 90 minutes and he is an attacking spot, maybe for GPP if you're looking for a goal. And then finally Delefeu, 7.7K. Pretty big ask. Uh, his minutes haven't been as ideal as I would like as well but he does have a solid enough floor if he happens to score that he will be doing really well and uh, finally Troy Deeney of uh, 6k is Troy Deeney what can you say you never know if he's going to get a negative or a penalty shot goal uh, so yeah don't sleep on Troy Deeney and GPP but definitely I would go Delafeo before I go either of those I think the card I have up on the screen there now is really viable depending on how you want to go about it uh, but uh, in terms of uh Spend up defense, spend down goaltender, and uh, spend one more player down low after that, depending on who you'd like. So yeah, that is it. 50 episodes this season. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I love EPL DFS, and I'm really looking forward to next season already. Good luck to everyone in the King of the Pitch. Fortunately, I didn't make it. Had a few top five finishes this season, but couldn't pull one in. Good luck, everyone. Final week. Have fun. Take care. Maybe back for some Champions League talk, but that'd be about it. Rotopros.com. Get over. Check us out. Top uh, right-hand corner. Drop down the articles. Lots of free content. Sign up uh, on our site. Uh, join the join the Slack. Get in their conversation. And, uh, yeah, hit me up on Twitter. Rad Rob Diamond. And look at me on the site, Sir Robert Six. Take care, everyone. Good luck. Lots of love.